Please welcome to talk about the latest in Premier and other things, Carl Soleil. All right, thank you so much, Michael. All right. Um, just really quickly, um, we just continue to see a lot of growing adoption with Premier Pro. Um, you know, in this market, obviously, there's a mix of different NLEs, but particularly for places like um, you know the trailer houses, uh, independent films. This year at uh, Sundance, we had something like 105 or 110. I forgot the final count of uh, the films were actually all cut in Premiere, so we're seeing a lot of uh, the independent films. Um, we've got a really good partnership with Netflix, and uh, there's a number of different films cut in Premiere. Um, anybody see the uh, Beyonce movie that just came out? That was, that was a Premiere edit. Um, so we're just continually seeing uh, adoption, growing adoption in different sectors of the market here. Uh, it was an exciting year, if you didn't hear. Um, both After Effects and Photoshop were actually honored by the Academy this year. Um, so that was uh, really, really cool to see. Um, you know, some of the folks on the After Effects teams have been there since day one. And so it was really cool to see them actually get up on stage and accept a, a SciTech award from, uh, from the Academy. Um, as Michael said, NAB this year for us was super, super packed. Um, we just continued, um, this, this release, what we really focused on when we talked to, uh, uh, talked with customers, we're really trying to get their feedback, and the, the biggest pillars that we uh, saw people asking for, better stability, better performance in the software. Um, we really took that to heart. In fact, the core engineering team really didn't work on any new features this release. Um, if it was up to them, they were like, let's come out with a release and just say no new features at all, let's just focus on the performance side and, uh, and stability side. Now, there are new features in Premiere, and a lot of these actually come from some of the different teams on the software. Um, the uh, motion graphics team added some new features. The um, film team actually added a new workspace, which I'm gonna, I'm gonna show you a little bit later here. Um, this was just an interesting number that I heard. Um, 604 billion, 800 million minutes of video being consumed every week by 2021. It ain't going down, <laughs> it's going up on a regular basis. And just from a, a performance, and I don't know how many here, if you're working professionally, do you have more or less deliverables today than you did five years ago? More, way more, right? So um, just talking a little bit about performance and stability, um, we did a lot of work in this cycle to support multiple GPUs better. Now, we have supported multiple GPUs in the past. Um, if you had a Mac Pro, you would see both GPUs actually being used during renders and export. We did a lot of work to kind of re-thread uh, and re-optimize all of that architecture. So what you're gonna see now is a performance boost, even on a five-year-old Mac Pro cylinder, um, you're gonna see better optimization and better use of those dual GPUs. Um, this also means on something like a MacBook Pro, you can add an external GPU and Premiere will automatically recognize and tell which card is the faster card, use that card for rendering on the timeline, performance on the timeline, but it'll still utilize both GPUs um, when it comes time to export out files. So because of this, we are starting to see on certain file formats, depending on what you're doing in the timeline, up to six times faster uh, performance. Another area that we uh, were able to go in and optimize, if you've ever used masking and tracking inside of Premiere Pro, um, this release, we found some uh, tricks that we could use to actually make the masking and tracking uh, up to four times faster, even when you're just working with HD files. But where we really see a huge performance benefit is uh, when you start getting into higher raster sizes. So 4K, 6K, 8K. It's pretty rare I get to get up on stage and talk about a 38 times faster uh, feature from one release to another. So, you know, this is the type of thing that the core team really, really focused on. Um, just to mention After Effects, this is also true of After Effects. There's been a, you know, the last several releases have been focused on adding more GPU support, adding better multiprocessing support in After Effects. Uh, so there's new GPU accelerated effects in After Effects as well. That's it for my slides. 
I, everybody knows I'm not much of a PowerPoint fan, so I'm going to jump out of that and actually start showcasing some of the new features in some of the different applications. And the first thing I just really quickly want to touch on is a long-standing feature that actually came from a website called User Voices. Now, this is something to be aware of. If you're editing away and you suddenly have that, like, brainstorm moment, oh, wouldn't it be great if Premiere did this? Or wouldn't it be great if After Effects did that? In the Help menu now, in the application, there's an option here called Provide Feedback. This will take you to a publicly facing site where you can upvote features. And if you think we don't listen to this, this release, um, three or four of the top five features were actually um, handled in this release. And one of those, a long-standing feature request, was the idea of having markers and guides in the program monitor. I'm sorry, guides, rulers and guides. Um, so there is now a view menu in the top of Premiere that did not exist before this release. And we've taken a lot of the common functions, put them into this view menu, but most importantly, we've also added the ability to turn on rulers and guides in the program monitor. If I want to put a guide in, I just grab from the ruler and drop it in. Um, even better, these, these guides can actually come from either Premiere or from After Effects. We're reusing the same guides from After Effects in Premiere, from Premiere into After Effects. So when you save one of these out, uh, you know, an After Effects artist could actually give you a guide, and from the View menu, you can come in and create and, and import these in from the Guide Templates menu. Um, I can choose Manage Guides, and then from here, click Import. And you already saw I have a, a, a number of different guides um, that I've got in the list there. So any guides that I want to use, I can simply come in to my markers and guides here. I should have a folder if I can see. There we go. Um, so if I want to import a guide that somebody has given me, I, all I have to do is just double click on it, add it to the list here, and then from here under the view menu, I can go to guide templates and bring those in. So these, again, can be created in After Effects or created in Premiere Pro, and they can be easily shared. Um, another thing that we have focused on, we've added in this release, is something called Render and Replace. Now, Render and Replace actually originated as a David Fincher feature. This was something that came from the editorial team um, working on Gone Girl, they used a lot of After Effects compositions and they wanted to be able to render those down to a new piece of media directly in the Premiere Pro timeline. Uh, particularly for like preview screenings and the like, they wanted to make sure that those were flattened out. Didn't want to go through the hassle of going to After Effects, rendering out a file, importing it into Premiere, putting it on the timeline. Wanted just like a one step uh, way of doing that. We found that uh, when you're dealing with clips and you have a heavy effect stack inside of Premiere, we've always had the ability to render a preview file. You know, I can choose to mark an endpoint, mark an out point, and come up here and choose render into out, and that will create a preview file. And that functionality is not going away. But what we found is as more and more people are doing shared projects, as they're moving sequences from one project to another, they're opening up sequences across shared media, these preview files can be a little bit fragile. Um, and the last thing you want to do is open up a project like five minutes before a producer's coming in for a screening and suddenly see red on your timeline. So what we have added is now in the Premiere Pro timeline, you can right click on a clip and say render and replace and by doing this, this will render to a format of your choosing. Um, you, know, you can use ProRes, you can use Cineform, you can create your own uh, preset for this. Um, however you want, there's an import preset button here. And what this will do is it will effectively bake this into a new piece of media for you. It puts that media next to the original clip um, and it replaces it out on the timeline with this rendered file. So you'll see this clip here is now showing it is now a rendered file and it's now a ProRes file. Um, when I do that, it bakes the effects um, into the file. So you'll notice here under the effect controls, it's still showing me the warp stabilizer effect. It's still showing me uh, Lumetri color is on this file, but it's now showing these are rendered. 
Now, if I need to get back to the original clip, I simply uh, right-click on it and choose Restore Unrendered, and that will take me back to the live effects again. So again, we're not using this, this isn't necessarily a replacement for rendering out preview files. Um, you know, if you're working on your laptop and you're working on a solo project, preview files are more than robust enough. It's usually when you're working in a, a, a shared environment where you're copying sequences from one project to another and you just wanna make absolutely certain that uh, any heavy effect stacks that you've done um, are, are rendered down um, and baked in so that you get smooth performance in front of the producer, in front of the director, and so on. Cool? Okay. Um, the, uh, the other thing that uh, the team did some additional work on, if you haven't played with the uh, motion graphic templates that exist and the, uh, the essential graphics panel within Premiere Pro, the team is constantly working to improve and enhance on this workflow. Um, a couple of versions ago, we swapped out the old title tool. It is still in the software if you go under uh, new legacy title, but the shiny new title tool is uh, simply found in the program monitor. Um, there's a type tool found here. Uh, the pen tool also has a rectangle and an ellipse function that can be used for making shape uh, shapes. While you're working on these in the program monitor, if I, I'm just gonna select my type tool here and just select some of this text here so that you can see some of this in action. Um, the Essential Graphics panel works similar to how you would expect Photoshop to work. We have a layers section here so I can quickly see where my text is, the different shapes that I have associated with this. And some of the new features that we've added for this release, it's now possible to have multiple strokes on your text. There's a, a plus and minus button that shows up here so that you can, uh, you know, you want to do something 80s themed like this, you, uh, you now have that capability. Um, you can see if I take this text here and click on the plus to add an additional stroke, um, I can start to come in here and stylize this however I want. We'll just increase the layer on that. I'll go back and add the original stroke in, and in this case, we'll add something nice and Christmassy. Please don't judge my text design skills by what I'm going to show you here on, there we go. So you can see how we're stacking multiple strokes on top of the text here. But really, really cool, we now have a button down at the bottom for masking uh, with text. So this allows you to create effects like seeing video underneath your graphic, um, punching through, if you will. And uh, that's done by uh, working with this mask with text, turning this on, and either leaving it alone or inverting it like I'm doing here so that the text itself is transparent and we're seeing the, uh, the video punching through underneath it. All right, now the, the biggest new thing, I touched a little bit on the better performance with the Mercury engine um, and some of the improvements we've made. We've got better playback with things like HEVC files. Um, we've also been working very closely with RED, and so all of the RED decode, debayer functionality that we've had um, is now utilizing Apple Metal. Now, this is an important thing. How many here, obviously we've got a lot of Mac users, how many here are already on Mojave? Okay, how many here are still on High Sierra? And how many Sierra users do I have? Okay. Um, if you are on High Sierra or Sierra, um, we did give some guidance in a, uh, in a blog post um, last uh, October. A lot of people missed it, but I just want to kind of point this out. We are really all in on Apple Metal. We do a lot of the development towards uh, Apple Metal. So if you are setting up a project or if you're opening up an older project, uh, you may want to look at your project settings and just see what renderer is being used. Um, it, particularly on Mojave, we feel that um, using this subsystem instead of OpenCL will actually get you uh, better performance, better stability. Um, we are seeing big performance gains with Apple Metal, and it is the recommended subsystem, particularly on Mojave. Um, it really, really uh, speeds things up. The last area that I was always telling people you might want to stick with OpenCL was if you were dealing with RED files, and now as of this new release, RED is all, uh, all in on Metal as well. 
Now, by using metal, this also opens up some additional workflows I'll talk about later, where we've got the core engines for these applications actually running on iOS and soon to be Android. Um, but on iOS in particular, Apple Metal, is it's the same basic development platform. Um, and so that's one of the reasons why you're seeing us uh, kind of sticking with that. It is uh, Apple's preferred way of, of accessing the GPU. It's built right into the operating system. Um, so if you are using the older OpenCL, we did give guidance for a long time saying use OpenCL. Metal has really caught up, and uh, particularly with Mojave, um, I really, really uh, prefer using this. Um, another area that we've also added better support for, um, HEVC playback. Um, with HEVC, particularly when you start dealing with like drone footage at 4K, 6K, 8K, um, we're getting much better performance and playback when it comes to using HEVC as an editing codec. Um, this is another one of those cases, I'll get off my soapbox in a second here, but HEVC, of course, never designed for editorial use. It's a playback codec. And of course, now cameras are shooting to HEVC. The same thing happened with MPEG-2, the same thing happened with MP MP4 files. Um, so we do support uh, HEVC playback, and this release in particular, we can do more on the graphics card um, to leverage better performance and decoding of these files. Uh, this also includes uh, better performance for uh, GH5 cameras from Panasonic, I believe had a 10-bit HEVC variant, and that's now included in this release. Okay, um, the last thing that I really quickly want to touch on in Premiere before I kind of jump to another application has to do with looking at files. Now, we have had the ability to look at a list view in the past, and it's always been possible to uh, create, using this metadata panel here, um, I can add additional columns of metadata here. And so, as we were talking earlier about proxies, um, there are some different uh, things that I can add in here as far as whether proxies are attached or not. I can add in these metadata columns and I can move these around within my project. Something new that we added in this release that's really, really nice is in the project flyout menu, there is now an option to save your columns into a preset. So if you need to jump between different views of metadata, Thank you. I love spontaneous. I'm, I'm soaking it in. I'm soaking it in. Okay. Um, so the idea here is you can actually have different presets for different, um, different purposes. You know, if you have to look, you want to have a preset for looking at uh, whether your proxies are attached and put that in the, in the, in the uh, you know, sort of the, the passenger seat, if you will. That's kind of what I call this column here right next to the file name is uh, I call it the passenger seat because by having it over here, um, this means that uh, it's the first thing that I see next to the file names. So it's, uh, it's really nice to be able to just kind of swap out what you're looking at. And on top of that, these uh, presets can be assigned to different uh, keyboard shortcuts. So you can have up to 10 of these views assigned to keyboard shortcuts to easily toggle back and forth between the different views. Now this not only works in the list view, this also works in the thumbnail view. So if I'm looking at a particular bin, and I'm just gonna go back into sequences, and let's go back into my free form here, and we'll just open up this one. If I'm looking at a grid view, I can also use that same functionality to have different view presets set up in here to organize clips based on different metadata columns and things like that. Now over the past few years, we've had more and more editors coming over to Premiere Pro and one thing that we were getting a lot of feature requests for um, was to break out this grid view into more of a freeform layout. In other words, be able to group clips different size clips, give them color markers so that they're associated in different ways. Um, one particular editor we worked really closely with, uh, Lisa Zeno Churgan on a film called Old Man and the Gun, uh, was one of our engineering engagements. Um, she provided a lot of feedback on this, but it was a number of different editors that all contributed to this. This release, we have added a new view for the bins, which is called Freeform View. 
And the idea behind freeform view is within freeform view, I can create icons of different sizes, but most importantly, I can put them anywhere I want on the screen. I can select a group of clips, move them over to this upper corner. I could say, change the clip size of these. These are smaller. Um, we can also, if things get messy, if clips kind of get moved in a weird way and you want to kind of align them, you can do a group selection and choose align to grid. Oops, well, that aligned to not exactly the way I wanted, but you get the idea. Um, and basically it gives me, you'll notice that while I'm looking at these clips, I still get the hover scrub behavior being able to hover over a clip um, but even more importantly, the, the mark in and mark out keyboard shortcuts are still active. So if you're looking to very quickly find like, you know, a hero shot like this, you can just tap the I key to mark an in, tap the O key to mark an out. And if you look very closely on this clip, you'll see this little blue line here indicates the in and out points that we just set for that. Um, J, K, and L are also active. Um, so you don't lose anything if I want to click on a clip and actually play it back with audio. I can do that um, by using J, K, and L. And so now I can go fast forward, pause, rewind, um, using the J, K, L keys, and then use my in and out markers for that. Um, there's also the metadata that you see within these clips is something that you can customize. Um, you can have, this is showing how we have two rows of, of metadata um, associated with these files. I'm seeing uh, raster size and I'm seeing an overall time duration. Um, but this is something that we can actually go in and we can play with what metadata is, uh, is being shown in this particular view. Um, so you can either get rid of these colors, you can actually get rid of the uh, label colors if you wanted to change out the label colors or not show the label colors, you can do that as well. Um, best of all, with this type of viewing, if you're a, a visual person, it's possible to go in and actually build out a uh, sort of a storyboarded sequence um, by taking a series of clips and either lining them up at the top or lining them up at the bottom of what you actually want to drop to a timeline. So this is just a, an alternative, alternative way of kind of organizing your shots where you don't have to uh, be in a timeline view to actually kind of pick out the various shots that you want to work with. If I say I've moved my shots around and I've got this is the list of clips that I want to drop to a new sequence, I can simply select them in the bin go back into a view where I've got my sequence and just grab these and drop them to a sequence and I'm ready to get going from there. So um, again, it's something that, you know, by working with these editors, it wasn't just a matter of saying, you know, well, what are you expecting it to do? It was basically, how can we make this work the, the way you really, really want it to work? Uh, how can we improve on the workflows that you already know? I see a hand up in the back. Uh, so how, do, how does this work if the clips are not in a line? Um, it generally uses a preference of going from the upper left to the lower right. Um, so if things are just kind of weirdly stacked, um, you know, if you have things in kind of a stack going, again, from upper left to lower right, it'll grab those and put them in order onto a sequence. Um, but that's, it, it's, it's the most logical preference for doing it that, that we could think of. Um, I don't think there's, there might be logic in here. I'd have to double check this. It is a new feature and one of the things that we could typically do before with a grid view, and I think it's still active in this, is that uh, I can select and use command or control to select a particular order of shots and then drag and drop and it will maintain and preserve that order. So that's another way of kind of overwriting that. I have to double check and make sure that's working in the uh, freeform view, but I'm pretty sure it is. Okay. All right. Thank you. <laughs> um, as far as other things inside of this release of Premiere, I mean, there's been a lot of work to help to improve on um, organization for our shared projects workflow. 
Um, now, shared projects are designed to work off of a shared storage so that lead editor and an assistant editor or a lead editor and multiple assistant editors can kind of break up a larger project into smaller bite-sized chunks that people can work on. Um, this is being used um, in various projects all over town. We've got um, a couple of feature films that rather than just having one gigantic Premiere Pro project that takes a while to open, um, they have broken up the project into something like 200 separate projects. The lead editor likes to work using scene bins. So basically imagine each of those scene bins for the film are actually a separate Premiere Pro project on disk. Um, the way to organize this and keep it so that you kind of know who is using what um, is to utilize sort of a top level project or a master project which is kind of what I have here. And you'll notice that as I twirl down these, uh, these bins, these are shortcuts to other Premiere Pro projects. There's a couple different ways to create these in the software. Um, you can just choose to make a new shared project and it'll put that in a relative space to your master. Um, or you can just drag and drop in a, an existing Premiere Pro project if you need. Um, but you'll notice that a couple of these are currently locked. I want you to pretend, if you will, that Mike Burton, the lead editor, is like behind this wall someplace in another editing bay. I kind of faked this a little bit for tonight. Um, but uh, that's the, the idea behind how this works, is if I open up, I come in, I open up the master project, I immediately see, okay, Mike's working on this, so I tell you what, I'm gonna open up this version of the cut, and we'll open up that sequence there. If I go back and look at the master project, you'll see my laptop shows up having this part of the project open. Now, if something Mike is working on, if I need to pull that into my project to do some changes, or maybe he's cut a scene a new way and I need to kind of bring that in and look at it, I can open up his project, but I can't make any changes to it. So when I open up this, it tells me it's in read-only mode. It gives me a little lock icon to show, hey, wait a minute, this is in read-only mode. And if I load this into source and go back to, if I try and change anything in Mike's sequence here, it's just not going to let me do it. It's locked. There's no way I can, I can affect that. Now I can copy this into my project and then start working with it. Or even easier, I can use the fact we can load a sequence in source here. So, you know, I can actually play this here. And there's the sequence in the source monitor. Here's my version of the cut. And in this case, you know, I want to take Mike's version of this particular part of the sequence. I can mark an endpoint, mark an out point, and insert or overwrite. Um, and making sure that this little button here is set to just show me the individual clips. You can see I now have all the individual clips from uh, V1 through V5, V4, V and uh, A1 through however many audio channels there are. So I can pick and choose exactly what I want to cut in. Make sense? So yeah, we're doing a lot of work to help to improve on some of these workflows. Uh, you know, collaboration is definitely something that uh, our group, the film team, has been uh, hard at work at. Um, you know, this is still kind of like a, a 1.1 iteration of this. So, uh, you know, expect to see, you know, additional improvements and enhancements on this moving forward. One thing that we have added as well when you're dealing with this, and this was something that was mentioned um, in the, uh, um, in the uh, Stump the Guru session earlier, is sometimes when you bring across clips, um, particularly if you have markers, if somebody else has put different markers on their master clips from the, what you have on your master clips, it can sometimes result in some duplicate media. The way to get around that is open up your project and there's an option here called Consolidate Duplicates. And what that's gonna do is it's gonna look for references to clips that all have the same file name. So currently, if you're throwing those in like a, you know, ZZ ignore folder or something in your project, and you don't wanna delete them for fear it's gonna delete them out of your sequences, um, you can now actually use this to uh, consolidate duplicates. Um, there's a little bit of a, a trick you can use if you know one set of clips are the ones you absolutely want to keep, the other set are the ones you absolutely want to get rid of, create a folder called Recovered Clips. Uh, 
capital R on recovered and capital C on clips. Anything that's in that folder is what's gonna get merged into the other master clips. So just a little, little tidbit there. It's just kind of a, a, a way of, of kind of getting around that. It's, it's much, much improved. If you were on the original version 12 when we first introduced shared projects, we've made uh, huge improvements on, on how this works um, already. And just know that it is something that we're looking at uh, for the future. So how exactly does Consolidate Duplicates work? Well, what it does is it looks for the clips that are the most organized, okay? What I mean by that is if you've got your dailies organized with uh, folders and subfolders, um, those are the ones it's typically going to keep. Um, it, uh, it really just runs on the entire project and it, it chooses um, you know, based on how organized the clips are. So anything that's in the root level versus something that's in a subfolder, um, the root level clips are gonna be the ones that disappear and those references are gonna be merged into the ones that are, that are organized. Um, if you want to have full control over this, like I said, anything that is in a recovered clips folder, those are immediately marked for deletion. So that's kind of a nice, nice way of, of kind of giving some manual control to the process. Yeah, recovered clips are the ones that it will remove and merge those references in your sequences to the ones that are in you know, your, the other folder. So the recovered clips folder, um, this is something that happens when you have clips in a sequence and you're copying that sequence from one project to another, um, you should have references to all of those clips should have been in your, the, your bins. You know, any video clip that's on a Premiere sequence needs to have a reference in a bin. Um, the recovered clips folder shows up when you get files where it just can't, it's not seeing a reference. Um, it's, it's sort of like a last ditch effort if, as you're moving something from one project into another project, if it can't find the, uh, the references to those clips anywhere, it will create them for you. Um, when and how that's supposed to happen, it's one of those things that, uh, um, it's a bit of a mystery. We, we don't want it doing it. Um, it's sort of in there just on the cases where, uh, you know, again, if there's something that happens where you're bringing in a, a sequence and somehow you found a way to delete the reference files in the bin, it's gonna create a recovered clips directory. Um, so I have seen some very rare cases where somebody has like imported a sequence and then without doing anything, they immediately go over to their project bin and hit the delete key and it deletes all the references that were just brought in with that sequence. Not supposed to be able to do that, but I've seen some people figure out ways to do that. And so the recovered clips folder is kind of what happens in those, those cases. Um, so yeah, in this case, if you ever get a recovered clips folder, um, you should feel pretty confident you can just come up and choose to um, consolidate duplicates because this function is, um, will, automatically take anything that's in a recover clips directory and it'll merge, it'll find the, the other uh, master clip and it'll merge it in. Okay. All right, really cognizant of how much time I have and uh, um, I wanna make sure Nicholas, uh, you guys get your break and Nicholas gets to uh, speak here. I'm gonna leave time for Q&A at the end. Very, very quickly, I just wanted to, to touch on one feature for Adobe Audition uh, that was added. Um, if you're, how many here uh, do keyframing of audio of, of music files to uh, like duck the music down underneath dialogue? Why are you still doing that? <laughs> um, we do have a a function that's built into both Premiere and After Effects using the Essential Sound panel. If you look up auto ducking, um, it's something that is in the Essential Sound panel in both Premiere and After Effects. Um, I'll see if I have time to, uh, to th bring up a quick demo of how to do it. We added in this release the ability to automatically duck ambient sounds. So in the past it worked with uh, music. It's pretty magical. It uses our uh, Adobe Sensei machine learning technology. So it goes through and it listens for clips that are marked as dialogue and it'll automatically generate keyframes for you. And best of all is it eliminates the hassle of 
you know, click, for every time you need to duck the music down, it's like four, ki four clicks, right? You have to click four times to generate four keyframes. This will create those four keyframes for you, and they're fully modifiable once, once it does its thing. It, it takes a second to do it. So I highly recommend looking, looking at that. Now the other new feature, and this is something specific to Audition, which is why I kind of wanted to show this. This, everybody does at least temp voiceovers, right? You guys, at some point or another on some project, you have to do a voiceover. And if you're like me, you have to do multiple takes of the voiceover. Um, we've added a function in Adobe Audition called punch and roll. And the idea behind punch and roll is this is designed to just make it much faster, much easier to, uh, when you're doing some sort of a voiceover, some sort of a narration, to be able to go back over a mistake and just very quickly re-record over it. Um, so the way this works, to start with in Audition, um, if I right click on the record button, I can change this from the instant record mode, which is typically what it does, to something called punch and roll mode. And there are preferences inside of Audition for how much of a pre-roll that we want to have. So I've got mine set for three seconds. You might want it for five seconds. It really just depends. Now how this works, I'm going to start at the beginning of my project here. And I'm just going to do kind of a, a crazy uh, voiceover here for you guys. So let's just go ahead and hit start. And in the beginning, there was a bicycle. And that bicycle had a tire. And this kid came down and when found his young, father going out to ride. Anyway, you get the idea. Um, so here I've done that recording. Now, I hated the last section of that, so what I'm going to do is actually just back up my playhead to where the last section was and hit punch and roll again. And what you'll see is this is going to start playing this back again with a 3 to one countdown so that I can pick up right where I made the mistake, okay? I'm just gonna put my hand on the level here so I can bring this up and down, and we'll hit record. So there's my three, two, one countdown, and then the father got on his bicycle and the kid was very sad. Okay, uh, didn't like that. Now here's the best part, you can set up a keyboard shortcut to just punch back to that same point again. So I've got mine set up to Command Shift P, three, two, one, and the kid snuck down, found his dad getting on the bicycle, getting ready to to ride all the way to San Francisco, and he was very sad. Okay, so you get the idea. Again, every time I do this, it's actually uh, dropping it right in to the same track, so I don't have multiple tracks to deal with. And best of all, I'm not actually overwriting the audio. Each of these are a separate clip. If I pick this up and move it out of the way, you can see that the previous take is sitting there underneath it. So it gives me a, just a really nice workflow for these types of things where you need to create a, uh, a voiceover um, and you might need to punch back into it to kind of redo a section that, uh, you know, I know I, I cough and burp into the microphone and a million other things that, uh, prevent me from doing a, uh, a one-take wonder. I see a hand up in the back. There's no audio cue associated with the three, two, one countdown. It's strictly a visual cue on the, uh, on the program monitor. Okay. All right. Now, I'm gonna jump over to After Effects because I wanna showcase, how many here have already seen Content-Aware Fill for Video? Kind of a funny story, we, uh, we gave the Hollywood Reporter um, like special permission to talk about this feature ahead of time. They were supposed to talk about this um, on, I think it was like March 28th, which was a Friday. Everything got pushed to Monday, which happened to be April Fool's Day. And so they came out with a story about Content Aware Phil on April Fool's, and everybody was like, oh yeah, right, you know. And then we shipped it like two days later, so. Um, so Content Aware Fill, the idea behind Content Aware Fill is um, this technology is something we've been kind of playing with in the labs for, for quite a while. And I'm actually going to start with this shot here just because 
It's the type of thing, there's a complex background going on in the background. Nobody would typically want to remove the soccer ball from a shot like this, and if you did, it would take forever. <laughs> um, what Content Aware Fill does is it takes any masked out area, and it doesn't necessarily even have to be a mask. This will work with chroma key technology. This will work with, if you've masked something in Mocha, it'll work with that. Really, you just have to have a way of saying, hey, this area here on the screen, these pixels, this is what I want to fill in. So in this case, I've already created a mask, and I've done some simple tracking of that mask around the soccer ball. So nothing special about that. There's nothing new on, the, on that front. You still have to tell After Effects uh, what you're trying to remove. Now, once you do this, set the area so that it basically is punching a hole. And you'll notice we have this new panel in After Effects called Content Aware Fill. Content Aware Fill looks at the entire composition and looks for transparent pixels. So in this case, you can see the white on black area here. It's already picked out the soccer ball, um, so it knows what it wants to pull from. The controls for this are really, really simple. I've got an expansion slider where I can kind of expand out the area that I want to work with. Sometimes a few extra pixels just helps to blend it better. I've got a couple of different fill modes. I'll talk about these a little bit later, but since we're removing an object, object mode makes sense. And at this point, I'm just going to click the Generate Fill Layer button. And we'll give this just a second. There we go. What this has created for me, and it's, did, it's done this while you've been uh, sitting there, is it has created a series of new pixels and put them into a PNG layer. It does this using a number of different tricks. This is something that's powered by the Adobe Sensei technology. Um, it analyzes and it looks at previous frames and next frames to see if there are pixels that showcase what's behind the object. And it will pull from those. Even if it doesn't see what's behind the object, it will use content aware technology to synthesize pixels and figure out what will probably look best to fill the hole. So the end result of this, and this is not going to be perfect. I'm putting it up on a big screen here, and I'm already going to, I'm going to point out some of the flaws with it. Um, but it's pretty darn good. <laughs> um, thank you. So we were, uh, I've been playing with this off and on um, in the labs, um, you know, for about the last year. And I, the thing that really blows me away is how the After Effects team has implemented it. Because in addition to um, just working its magic, it really leaves you in a good space that if you're, you know, you're dealing with a post supervisor that pixel peeps on everything and needs everything to be absolutely perfect, Everything's kind of laid out for you to go back in and make those additional changes if you need to. Um, if it doesn't do it perfect the first time, you can also run it a second time. If there's a little bit of an artifact left over at one point or another, mask the artifact and run it again. <laughs> um, so it's, it's one of those tools that just the implementation of it is, uh, is a very real world uh, type of implementation. And uh, that really, really... Uh, uh, just makes me makes me really happy. Um, I love this shot as an example because I'm typically the the B camera operator that walks into frame of the hero shot. <laughs> so obviously the lighting here is just perfect. Even if we rush, quick, quick, get back, back to positions. We got to shoot it again. Uh, the lighting's not the same. Um, so this is a perfect example of where Content Aware Phil can help with this. So. I'll just twirl down just to show you what the mask look, looks like here that we're cutting in this case. Let me see. Oh, I don't have. There we go. So again, a loose mask is better in a lot of these cases. Um, you don't want the mask to be super tight because you also have to think about what the extra bits around the person. If you're trying to track out a car and the car is on a dirt road and there's dust being kicked off, guess what? You got to get rid of the dust too or it does something, makes it look really Terminator uh, weird. 
So here we have, uh, again, a simple mask. This is the end result that comes out of content-aware fill. And again, if I turn the mask off, there's the end result. If you're looking at the left side of the screen during this shot, then something is horribly, horribly wrong anyway, because your attention is probably focused on the two people walking through the shot anyway. So um, just a couple of other quick examples. Um, this is a great example of what I was just talking about. When I was playing with this early on, I used to forget to mask the shadow. <laughs> And that creates kind of a weird Terminator effect. It's great if that's what you're looking for, like a, like a Predator-style uh, uh, camouflage effect. But again, this is the patch that it, it picked out. Um, there's already some amazing uh, uh, examples online. Now, something about this, I get a lot of questions on occlusion, the idea of what if your object that you're trying to remove goes behind another object. My, my advice to you is try it and see what happens. Um, in some cases, you know, the object, if it's, if it's going behind something like you know, a window frame or something like that, chances are you may have to go back in and track in that window post or something like that uh, to make it look perfect. I just recently saw an example, somebody posted online, of a car, it was a van going behind a tree and they just did a simple mask around the van, and even as it went behind the tree, this was smart enough to just put the right shots, the foliage of the tree into the, I don't even know how it did that, but it did it. A um, Couple of other quick examples. If I'm doing something where I never see the pixels in the way that I want, here I've got an example. We really like this dramatic shadow of, the, uh, of this shot. Um, however, we've got two different camera operators standing in the frame, or this is a bush that's generating this big shadow here. So I want to get rid of these other two shadows. Again, uh, creating masks uh, around these, doing the track, bip, bip. Uh, we can get rid of those. Now this is actually utilizing a different mode. Rather than getting rid of an object, this is where I could get rid of a surface. So this is the mode that you would typically use if you're trying to get rid of a poster on a wall, you're trying to get rid of a logo on a hat, something along those lines. Because again, you never see what's behind the object. Uh, this is going to, uh, to be the best mode to use. And again, you don't need to use um, masks necessarily. Uh, this is an example where we're actually using the roto brush uh, to remove this young lady from the shot. And again, the end result looks something like this. Now, you can also kind of guide this in a certain direction if you want. Uh, as an example of this, I can actually come in and uh, create a reference frame and send that over to Photoshop. So in this example, I'm just gonna start somewhere in the middle. I've actually already done this at the beginning of the shot. Let me just turn that layer back off. Beginning of the shot, I've got a reference frame that was done in Photoshop. The end of the shot, I've got a reference frame. So I'm just gonna do one more in the middle just to show you how this works here. Right here, I'm just gonna grab this and there's a button directly in the Content Aware Fill panel where I can just click Create Reference Frame. When I do this, a couple of things happen. It drops a reference frame into my composition in a, in a layer, bottom layer, and it open up, opens up Photoshop for me. Now, if you haven't played with Photoshop and Content-Aware Fill in Photoshop recently, um, it works a little bit differently in that, and just to showcase how, uh, how easy this is to work with, I'm even going to do this the hard way here. I'm just going to use a... Uh, uh, a polygonal lasso tool here to just quickly say, let's take a little bit more out than just what we've masked here. Okay, I've got that area selected. Edit Content Aware Fill. Now the way this works, I have a two up viewing screen 
and the area in green is where it's pulling to fill the hole. So using this subtraction brush, I can come in here and say, you know what, this big rock in the foreground, eh, I don't want that to fill the hole. And it changes things a little bit. I've got another one over on this side. Again, we'll just take that out. Don't want that. And you can see how the background is getting better and better and better. So by using this as a guide to say, hey, these are the pixels that I want to use to fill the hole, um, you can even achieve a better result. So again, right out of the gate works great. This gives you an extra level of control if you need it. And by the way, this has some additional options over here on the side for doing color adaptation and rotation adaptation, meaning it'll take a chunk from elsewhere in the image and rotate it in a different way to fill the hole. So you've got a bunch of different options in here as far as this is concerned. Okay. All I have to do normally is hit save and go back to After Effects. For the sake of time, I'm just gonna delete that layer. And just again, this was the result that we had before. And if I turn on the content aware fill patch that it's generated, there's the end result. The patch that it generates, can you put that to Photoshop and tweak? So the, the patch that it generates, is there a way to flip that over to Photoshop to uh, tweak it further? Um, there's no automated function in After Effects to do that, but it is just a PNG sequence. So it is a, a series of PNG files on disk that you could easily use Finder, go in and find the frame that you want to want to adjust and, and open that over in Photoshop. Yeah. Uh, very last uh, example here, because this is one of my favorites. Here's the drone footage that was shot. Of course, when this uh, location was approved, we didn't know they were going to be doing construction and creating a new drainage ditch on the side here. And we couldn't quite get the perfect shot. There was too much traffic to get rid of these cars. So again, content aware, fill out the cars. No problem. Um, you'll notice if you look really, really closely, there's a little bit of an artifact right here. I can't believe I'm showing you the flaws, but I will. See, there's a little artifact there. So I've got another layer to just basically select and mask that out so the artifacts go away. There was another one in this corner. Oh, and the little construction on the side, let's just get rid of that as well. So at the end of the day, these are all the pixels that were being changed out. So um, very, very flexible tool for getting clean plates. Uh, if there's any danger associated with this, don't show this to your producers because, you know, can we get rid of the guy in the corner? So. Carl Soleil, everybody. All right. Thank you, guys. Thank you.